Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to Match Chats, and we are here with Dr. Arena Antonovich, who is working with Triplet, who are based in the US and a pharmaceutical company working in HD research um, and a fairly new organization, um, although Arena is not new in HD research. Um, Arena, welcome. Uh, would you be happy to introduce yourself and give you a little bit of your background? Yes, thank you very much, Matt. So, hello, everybody. I'm Irina Antoniewicz. I'm, as Matt said, the chief medical officer at Triplet Therapeutics. I have a background in clinical neurology and psychiatry. I trained in Germany for many years. I was working in a hospital with patients. And then I decided to go into industry. And my goal was really to help develop better therapeutics. I was working with different neurological disorders. We had many patients with movement disorders, so we had many patients with Parkinson's disease, but also a few patients with Huntington's disease. And as a clinician, I was just frustrated by the lack of data that would help me inform which drug to select for which patients and really su support just a better, in the end, clinical outcome of individuals that come with a disease that we have limited treatments, but maybe some treatments. And this took me into industry. So I've been in industry for 20 years. Um, during this period, I worked in many different companies, very large companies, very small companies, like from you know, 110,000 people to 11 people. But I've also been medical director at CHDI. This was in 2009, I started there. And this really introduced me from a more research side to the field of Huntington's disease. And I have remained in this field ever since. Uh, I worked at CHDI, I left, I worked again for a pharmaceutical company, I worked at Sanofi Genzyme, we had a gene therapy program, which is now at Voyager. I was at Wave Life Sciences, where I was obviously um, somewhat involved in their uh, therapy for HD. And so I have really been following what is happening in the field. And I do think that right now there is uh, a, a, huge, a, a, a huge excitement because there are so many drugs that are being taken into clinical trials in HD. And I do think it is a good thing that we try different approaches, different modalities. And we all know that it's not one size fits all. It's not one drug that will work for everybody the same way. So I do really hope that over the next few years, we will see major breakthroughs for new therapeutics in HD. Thank you, Irina. Um, yeah, so a little side note there. So CHGI, uh, some people will know of it, but a lot of people tend not to know what CHGI <laughs> is. So, um, but uh, just for people who aren't sure, it's like, it's a very important organization for HD research. Let's just say that, and um, maybe we'll chat about CHGI another time. Um, so Triplet, um, when, what is Triplet and when was it founded? So Triplet is just about two years old now. So it's a very young company. It was founded by our CEO and co-founder, Nesson Birmingham. He has a PhD. He was doing genetics research. He is also uh, an investor. He worked at Wall Street. So he really combines a very strong entrepreneurial spirit, but also a very deep sense about science and the science that can be applied to therapeutics development. So about two and a half years ago, he started to read about a new understanding of the pathomechanisms, the, the pathology, the, the, the disease mechanisms that seem to drive Huntington's disease. And the basis for, for what he was reading is what we call somatic instability, which means that you inherit a certain CAG repeat. So you inherit a certain length of the repeats in your mutant Huntington gene. But these repeats are not fixed, but they continue to expand in your lifetime. And so this is what we call somatic expansion or somatic instability. And Nesson read about this and he read about genetic modifiers that have been studied by researchers um, in Boston, such as Jim Guzella and Marcy McDonald, who were also among the scientists who discovered the mutant Huntington gene in the first place. 
So they were studying these genetic modifiers. They were trying to understand why there are these differences between individuals, even though they inherit the same repeat from a parent. And they identified that there are genes that influence how quickly this inherited repeat continues to expand in an individual. And so this is what triplet is targeting. So these are genetic modifiers, so genes that are in themselves not disease causing, but they can influence the, the rate of your mutant Huntington gene to expand and thereby have an earlier or later age of onset. And because the Huntington repeat is CAG, so it's a triplet, so this is where the name comes from. It's triplet therapeutics, targeting diseases. So it's not only Huntington's disease, it's also other diseases. They all share the same mechanism. And um, we started off with calling it triplet because many of the diseases have a repeat that is a triplet, but there are many diseases that are not triplets that also can be targeted with our approach, but we decided not to change the name. So we leave it as triplet, um, <laughs> but it is broader than that. Uh, uh, diseases that are caused by triplet repeats. Damn, I was going to ask about name change potential. <laughs> <laughs> like, damn it, we went for it. I'm going to keep it now. <laughs> it works for most. That's good. Um, so, what is the approach that Triplet has has found and is working on? Then, can you explain that? Yes. So. So unlike some of the other companies that are currently in clinical development already in Huntington's disease, you know, such as Roche and Wave and, and Unicure, they're targeting the mutant Huntington gene itself. So they're trying to lower it. So we think of our approach as upstream of that. And this is because we are targeting a gene which is part of what we call the DNA damage response pathway. So this is a pathway of multiple genes that regulate this expansion of the HTT, of the mutant HTT, mutant Huntington gene. So these genes, if they are modified by our approach, so we are developing therapeutics that can lower some of these upstream genes, and by lowering them, we can affect that the rate of expansion will either be slower or completely halted. And so that when you inherit, so the dream is you inherit a certain number of CAG repeats. We start our therapy early on, and then you don't continue to expand on your repeat. And in an ideal world, we would really prevent the onset of symptoms or slow the progression of symptoms if an individual has already symptoms. And we are doing this by using antisense oligonucleotides. So these are a new, relatively new class of drugs, but they have been tested in, in, in different clinical trials and some of them are also approved. So it is a new class of drugs that really binds, uh, that mimics a little bit the, 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 the DNA and RNA that is, you know, the, that is in our bodies, that is sort of the, the, the component of, of what constitutes a gene. And so there are these short uh, fragments of something that binds to a gene product and can lower the expression of a gene. So it's very similar to what is done for mutant Huntington. So you lower the expression of the mutant Huntington and therefore the downstream protein. So we are just lowering another gene that will then, because it's lower, in a positive way, impact the somatic expansion of the mutant hunting tension. Okay, I'm gonna sound stupid here, <laughs> sorry enough, but bear with me. Um, so it's, it's different to the gene silencing approach of some of the other companies in HD. So it's not where they're targeting the, the gene that's causing the problem, the CAG that's causing the problem there, but you're kind of, targeting it before it becomes a problem is that does that yes. make sense yes exactly okay okay interesting um so for someone uh, like myself who has a repeat of 45 um what would the treatment do for me would it be something that you would do um before you were symptomatic yeah so ideally once we have shown that our treatment you know is safe well tolerated and has some benefits in a population of patients that already started to have some symptoms. Yes, we would like to expand the therapy. So 
in an ideal world, we would like to really prevent the onset of symptoms. So for instance, in your case, if you don't have any symptoms, but you know you have a, you know, 45 repeats, you know, which is somewhat on the, on the longer side, we would want to intervene with our therapy early because we do know that um, this expansion that I explained does not occur everywhere. So it's not like the, the disease, the mutant Huntington gene itself. It, this expansion occurs predominantly in neurons, so in brain cells, in specific areas of the brain. And those areas are particularly early on affected. So we call it like this triatum that's in the middle of the brain, deep in the brain, but also the cortical area. So there are certain areas in the brain that are showing this phenomenon of somatic expansion. And they show this early on. We know this from some post-mortem brain studies where individuals, before they had full manifestation of HD, unfortunately died. The brain was analyzed. And this is how we know that this starts probably 10 to 15 years before the full motor manifestation. So this is where we think that it is um, sensible to go uh, at this stage of the disease when there are maybe very few symptoms um, or maybe even no clinical symptoms, but some signs like we can measure with imaging, we can measure you know, some uh, uh, brain volume loss or we can measure neurofilament light or we can measure different biomarkers. So yes, intervene early at a stage when there are many neurons that if we start our therapy and the therapy is efficacious, we would prevent further expansion and hopefully therefore prevent really the onset of symptoms for many, many years. Okay, and has this, I take it you've been testing this already, this approach, and how is it looking um, so far in the tests that you've done? So we have done different tests in animal models. So as everybody knows, there is no animal model that resembles HD in a human. HD is a very complex disease, many features, uh, and, and just any human is not like a mouse or a rat or, or a pig um, or not even a monkey. So we have done studies in mice. So they are well-established. Um, Huntington's disease mouse models. And for us, it was important to use a mouse model where the somatic expansion of the mutant Huntington gene actually occurs because this is the basis for our mechanism. So we know it occurs in humans, but not all animal models show this. So we have tested our molecule in two different animal models, and we have tested it also in a different ages in these animals. And so what we can see very uh, consistently is that when we inject one of these antisense oligonucleotides that it's in this case specific for the mouse gene because it's a mouse model. So when we give this antisense oligonucleotide to mice, we can stop the somatic expansion of the mouse, uh, whatever the mouse is carrying in terms of the mutant Huntington gene. And so because we have done this multiple times and at different ages and in different mouse models, we think that we are, we are pretty confident that this mechanism works. We have also used patient-derived cells. So patient-derived cells can be also used to study drugs. Of course, this is a simpler system than a mouse, but it is nevertheless patient-derived, so it has certain advantages. And in those cells, we also see the somatic expansion. So when you start with, let's say, whatever repeats you start with, and then they continue to expand in a cell culture dish. Yeah? And so when we give our molecule, we can stop that. So both of those data sets make us um, confident that the mechanism works. And then we have tested our molecule that is going to go into humans in uh, monkeys and also rats and also mice, but in this case, not carrying a mutant Huntington gene, but just normal animals, just to show if our oligonucleotide, antisense oligonucleotide is well tolerated, um, and whether it reaches the brain areas that are so important to be reached. And so this is what we have done multiple times in rats, mice, as well as monkeys. And again, we see good 
uh, acute safety and tolerability of our molecule, and we see that it reaches those brain areas. Interesting. Um, so, in humans, how would that treatment be administered, in theory? We are not really saying exactly how it is being administered. And the reason for that is that we are really still in the middle of testing the best way to administer it. And so, we are not confident, or rather, we don't believe that uh, an antisense oligonucleotide administered through a spinal tap can really reach these deep brain areas. So we think that there, there, there must be modifications to this administration to really afford the possibility to show a really clinically meaningful, strong impact. Uh, because we think it's, you know, spinal taps is also not so pleasant. And if you think of doing this over many years, you are a young man, you would have to do this for the next 30 years, you know, maybe this is also uh, difficult to imagine. And so we are looking at ways to, at the same time, make the continue, I mean, like the repeated administration more sustainable and feasible also for patients, while at the same time ensuring that the drug reaches those brain areas that we think are very important to be reached when we want to treat Huntington's disease. So you, you're looking at a couple of things at the moment. I have actually had uh, spinal tap um, twice. And yeah, for, for a study, I didn't have anything injected. I wasn't on a, any um, <laughs> drug trial, but yeah, I had, I had headaches for a week both times I did oh it. So God. it's oh not God, yeah. for me. But, um, <laughs> but if needs must, you know. <laughs> um, so we'll talk about SHIELD HD in a minute. You know. mm -hmm. But can we kind of talk about your upcoming trial for, for next year that you're hoping yes. for? Um, so what are you hoping to do for that trial? And when are you hoping to get that out? And where would it be? Do you have any details? So we anticipate that we will start this trial sometime in the second half of 2021. Uh, we cannot be more precise today than that because there is still a lot of uh, work that is going on to, to, to make uh, this happen, uh, but we think this is uh, realistic. And we, we currently think that it will be an international trial that would include um, centers in North America as well as Europe. And we, we, we think that the patient population that we would like to initially recruit for this trial will be very similar to our natural history study SHIELD HD. And also the centers that will be participating will be probably similar and in similar countries. And so those will be what we call uh, Huntington's disease patients with active disease. This is defined by uh, a new score. And this includes both pre-manifest and early manifest patients, but they have to meet a certain inclusion criterion and obviously have to be you know, healthy uh, enough to, to undergo the, the, the quite rigid and strict also safety evaluation that is part of every phase one clinical trial. I'm on mute. And um, do, you, do you have any idea how many people you'd be looking at for that phase one? Just small? Well, it will be, of course, initially a relatively small study because the main the initial goal will be to study safety and uh, tolerability and uh, as in any phase one clinical trial you start with a very low dose and then you go higher and higher so you always have a new group of patients that are then treated with higher and higher doses and so this is relatively short-term treatment that is again covered by all the safety animal studies that every company has to do prior to entering clinical trials. So we will do that. This will allow us to do a shorter term treatment or shorter term administration of our molecule in patients. But then we plan to also offer to all participants an extension study. So an extension study would mean that we have learned something about our molecule from the first part of the phase one clinical trial. We know what um, is safe and well tolerated. We will have also analyzed some 
biomarkers that tell us whether the drug is likely to you know, reach those brain areas and, and be there at sufficient concentration so that we can make a more informed decision at what dose level we think is relevant to take forward and then individuals who want to and you know, meet the eligibility criteria for the extension would be offered a continued administration of the drug in an extension study. And this ultimately will also help us determine safety and longer term tolerability, but also some signs of efficacy. And this is very similar to what other trials uh, are planning. And this is also a way of, of, you know, still having a small study. So I don't want to be too precise um, uh, about the, the exact number because it is still in the planning phase, but it will be, I would say anywhere between a 30 and, and maybe 80 patients also in this range. And, and so to, to maximize the, the learnings uh, for the subsequent trial, but also give everybody who participates the opportunity, you know, to have a potential benefit by participating. Thank you. Um, I have a general question. Um, because HD research is very busy at the moment, and it's going to get even more busy um, coming years. Do you think we have enough participants uh, for trials that will be happening? Or do you think that will be a problem? So in principle, HD is a rare disease, but a large rare disease. And when you consider patients who are also in this sort of prodromal pre-manifest disease stage, we call active HD, I think there are many more individuals than are needed for, for clinical trials. But of course, it is also true that in a clinical trial, particularly when you test a new molecule, there are certain restrictions on who can participate. There are certain restrictions on what other medications somebody takes, or if they have additional diseases that might make it very difficult for them to complete the assessments in a clinical trial. So this is what then, of course, further restricts the number of potential participants. So I think it will become harder to recruit the patients, for sure. I also think it will be uh, something that is important for the physicians, the HD clinicians, to discuss with their patients. Because for every individual, it is important to evaluate what trial is maybe best for them. And there are multiple factors, I would say, Maybe the mechanism of the drug. Some people are more excited about one approach than another approach. Or maybe some participants have heard from other participants what, how, how they think about it. But then there's also the, the frequency of assessments, for instance, or the way the drug is administered. Some drugs are administered uh, through an intravenous line. Others are uh, administered, as we said, um, through a spinal tap. Others are a small molecule. So they all have advantages and disadvantages. And I do think it's important to discuss with an individual in, in generally in general interested in a clinical trial, the pros and cons of the different trials that are being offered at a given clinical center. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's going to be interesting to see how that goes. But yeah, physicians will be uh, trying to manage everything. <laughs> I think it could be interesting. Um, and this is why I think something, you know, like what you are doing is so important to also inform and have the dialogue with the patient community because you as potential participant should also, I mean, it's good to talk to, you know, people from a company, your physician, but also read about whatever options you have and what maybe the pros and cons are. And we are very happy to engage in this dialogue with the patient community and, and listen to the the community, uh, what is important to them as we think of our phase one clinical trial. Yeah. Um, and what about SHIELD HD? Because that's happening right now, isn't it? Can you tell me yes. a bit more about that? Yes, absolutely. So we have 
announced uh, last week that uh, we have basically completed enrollment in SHIELD HD. So we are quite excited about that. And to your point about enrolling into clinical trials, so SHIELD HD is a natural history study. So there is no treatment being offered, no investigational treatment. We are not studying a treatment per se. We are studying just the course of the disease. And the trial, the study was really designed with our phase one clinical trial in mind. So we have recruited uh, participants who are pre-manifest and early manifest. And we uh, follow them over up to two years. So there are seven uh, visits over two years and we collect uh, spinal fluid and we collect blood samples and we look at the brain MRI scan and we look at um, clinical assessments such as the uh, uh, composite unified Huntington's disease rating scale and some cognitive tests. So all of these tests will help us better understand the uh, progression of these measures, both biomarkers and clinical measures over time in a patient population that we think will be the right patient population also for our phase one clinical trial. And thus patients that have enrolled in SHIELD HD will be evaluated if they're interested for the phase one clinical trial. So this was our, our explicit uh, goal that they can enter the phase one clinical trial if they want to meet the uh, phase one uh, inclusion criteria. And this would give us a rich data set for an individual you know, without treatment and then a period on treatment. So this can statistically be utilized to again help to understand what the drug is doing in an individual with the disease. And we can also allow patients from SHIELD HD who do not want to enter phase one to then be part of the phase one extension study. And again, the data from every individual in SHIELD HD will be further used to help us determine in the phase one extension study whether the drug is an effect because we will be able to compare individuals on treatment for a certain amount of time to individuals, particularly in SHIELD HD, who have not been on treatment. And because we are looking at similar assessments and a similar uh, population of patients, we think that this will be very informative. Okay, so you're using it as a, as a way to kind of compare and, and get better measurements for, for your treatment yes. for, the, for the trial. Makes sense, makes sense. And that's full, that's all full up now. You don't need anybody else to, to join in. Yes, we have. And so we are really, really fortunate. And I want to thank everybody, all the participants, of course, but then really also all the investigators. So we have started to enroll in May this year, and now we are in mid-November, and we have completed enrollment. And so we have projected before we had this current pandemic that we would need about seven months. And so we have now enrolled despite the pandemic in six months, and we have enrolled more patients than we initially planned. We had to increase enrollment because there was a high interest and the North American sites who were able to start earlier than the European sites had already recruited so many patients and the European sites, we wanted to give them an opportunity to also enroll. And so we increased the number of patients that we would allow into the study a little bit to make sure that the European sites that were so advanced in their study startup uh, that they could enroll some patients. And so with this increased enrollment, we have still completed enrollment ahead of time. And we are really grateful to the community for, for this. Thank you. And I have one last question. <laughs> We're almost there. Um, so what are triplets hopes uh, moving forward then? What's your hopes and dreams? My hope and dream is to really start the phase one clinical trial next year. Of course, then I dream that this drug, that we have this potential drug, this antisense oligonucleotide is safe and well tolerated and gets to those brain areas uh, and that we can identify a dose that 
you know, secures uh, the right concentrations in the right brain areas and can be given safely. And then the next dream is that we can do the phase one extension study. And unfortunately, it will take a little while before we can conclude if it works. But I really, really hope that in a few years from now, we can have a follow up conversation uh, and that I can tell you that it worked. I mean, this would be, of course, my dream um, and that it can become a therapy for Huntington's disease and that it can truly you know, prevent as well as slow disease progression. And because this is a mechanism that is not unique to Huntington's disease, but is really a mechanism that drives other diseases as well, such as spinal cerebellar taxias, DRPLA, uh, other CNS diseases, uh, we would like then to test this molecule once we have tested it in Huntington's disease in all of these other indications. So there could be a, a rapid uh, broadening of the spectrum of indications. And all of these diseases have a high unmet need, have really no disease modifying, and most of them not even good symptomatic therapies. Some of them are very rare, but having one molecule that could potentially treat many different patients with different diseases would just be a dream for me. Thank you, Arena. I don't have any more questions. <laughs> Thank you. No, even, mean, not even side ones, <laughs> but that was very so interesting. I, I really hope this was clear. If you have any further questions, please let me know. Or if anybody else in the community has any questions, we have on clinicaltrials.gov, uh, we, we list you at HD and there's an email that reaches us. And I do promise I, I, I look at those emails and I reply to them. And uh, of course, we can also be contacted through the Triplet website. And we really do take questions from the community seriously. Thank you very much for that. Um, hopefully people are listening and we'll take action there. Um, but triplet sounds very interesting. Therapy sounds very interesting as well. And yeah, here's hoping it's something that works for HD patients. Yes. Thank you very much for your time, Marina. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. And I do hope you stay safe and that we all get through this pandemic and we can see each other hopefully next year in person at some occasion. Would be nice. <laughs> Would be nice. <laughs> Take care. You have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. You too. Take bye -bye. care. Bye-bye.